Thank you all very much for inviting me. I'm looking at the teleprompter. Unfortunately, there's nothing there because my speech is here. But <laughs> I ain't a teleprompter guy. Uh, let me congratulate the National Urban League and Mark and all of you uh, for the enormous role you are playing uh, in, this in this country. Uh, fighting for social justice, and not only the ideas that you are bringing forth, but the day-to-day -day work that you are doing in terms of job training, in terms of helping small businesses secure financing and contracts, and the help that you have provided families with counseling when they are trying to realize the American dream of home ownership. And that's just a few of the areas that you have excelled in. Um, my views are a little bit different than others. I am the longest serving independent in the history of the United States Congress, and I am running for President of the United States today within the Democratic primary and caucus process. It is my belief from the bottom of my heart that I would not be running for President if I thought otherwise that given the enormous crises that this country faces today, crises that may be more severe than at any time since the Great Depression of the 1930s, that frankly it is too late for establishment policies, it is too late for establishment politics, it is too late for establishment economics. We need some new thinking, some bold thinking. And, and most importantly, and this may make some people nervous, and that's the way it is. <laughs> I think when we have a nation today where a handful of billionaires have unbelievable influence over the economic and political life of this country. There is nothing significant that we will accomplish unless we have the courage to take them on, and that is what this campaign is about. The themes that you have outlined for this conference <clears throat> are exactly right. Save our cities, education, jobs, and justice. As I get into those themes, the first point that I want to make is perhaps the most important. And I do understand that for some people this is uncomfortable, but I believe it has to be addressed. And that is that the United States of America today is the wealthiest country in the history of the world. But most people don't know that because much of that wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few. Today in America, we have more wealth and income inequality than any other major country on earth, and it is worse today than at any time since 1928. To me, it is that the top one-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. It is not acceptable that one family, family that owns Walmart, owns more wealth than the bottom 40% of the American people. It is not acceptable that in the last two years, the 14 wealthiest people saw their wealth increase by $157 billion, more wealth than is owned by the bottom 130 million Americans. The truth of the matter is, that we cannot run away from that reality. Income and wealth inequality is the great moral issue of our time. 
It is the great economic issue of our time. It is the great social and political issue of our time. And together, we must address that issue. Now, let me touch on another issue before I get to your theme of equal consequence. Some of you may have heard, maybe you didn't, didn't get a whole lot of press. A few days ago, former President Jimmy Carter described the American political system as corrupt. He described the United States as an oligarchy with unlimited political bribery being the essence of getting the nomination for president or to elect the president. What he was talking about is the disastrous Supreme Court decision on Citizens United. A decision which says to the wealthiest people in this country, you already own much of the economy. <clears throat> now we're going to give you the opportunity to buy the United States government. That decision is undermining the very foundations of American democracy, what men and women have fought and given their lives to defend. You tell me what it means when one family, the Koch brothers' family, will spend more money on this election cycle than either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Spend almost a billion dollars to buy candidates who will make the rich richer and everyone else poorer. That, to me, is not democracy. That is oligarchy. That's why we've got to overturn this disastrous Citizens United decision. And I guarantee you that all of the issues that candidates have talked about that you believe in will not take place when a handful of wealthy people are able to control our political system. Now, when we we talk about education, I trust that all of you know, as you do, that we live in a highly competitive global economy. To my mind, it is insane, and I use that word advisedly, that we have hundreds of thousands of bright young people, often minorities, who have the desire, who have the ability to get a higher education and go to college, but they can't go to college for the simple reason their families cannot afford the tuition. That is absurd. We need to have the best educated workforce in the world and not tell hundreds of thousands of bright young people that they cannot make it into the middle class, that they not, cannot contribute as engineers, as doctors, as scientists. And that is why I have introduced legislation and will fight for as president to make every public college and university in America tuition free. And what that means is that kids in the fourth grade and in the sixth grade will know that if they study hard, pay attention, do their schoolwork, even if their parents, like my parents, didn't go to college, even if kids in the neighborhood did not go to college, they will be able to go to college because the incomes of families will not be a determining factor. This will revolutionize education, I think. And when we talk about education, what we also have to understand and be frank is the world has changed since the 1940s and 50s. Mom is in the workplace. Dad is in the workplace. We need a first-class child care pre-K system in this country. In my state and all over this country, working class families struggling to find affordable quality child care. Child care workers are paid minimum wage. That is not how we should treat the most vulnerable children in America. Universal pre-K, well-paid teachers. 
Now let me say a word about jobs. You read every month that unemployment is 5.3 percent. The government comes out with a statistic. Please know that that statistic is only one of many statistics the government releases on jobs. That statistic does not include those people who have given up looking for work and those people who are working part-time, millions, when they want to work full-time. Real unemployment is not 5.3 percent, it is 10.5 percent. It is a crisis. And now let me tell you what very few people are talking about, which is an even greater crisis. And that is youth unemployment, which we don't talk about at all. I asked for last month a study from the Economic Policy Institute, and they came up with the results that nobody is questioning. Listen to this. If you are a white kid between 17 and 20 who graduates high school, you have a 33% unemployment rate. If you are an Hispanic kid, you have a 36% unemployment rate. If you are an African-American kid, 17 to 20, high school graduate, you have a 51% unemployment rate. That is unacceptable. That is turning our backs on an entire generation. And we must not allow that to continue. Now, when people talk about the tragedy of the United States having more people in jail than any other country, including China, one of the country and a half million young people in America, in my state, in your states, without jobs, without education, hanging around on street corners, doing bad things. It is my very strong opinion that it makes a lot more sense for us to be investing in jobs and education rather than jails and incarceration. That is why, along with Representative John Conyers of Michigan, I introduced legislation that would create one million jobs over the next several years for unemployed kids. And that is why I have introduced legislation that calls for a trillion dollar investment in rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, creating 13 million decent paying jobs. And when we talk about jobs and income, let me be very clear. The $7.25 minimum wage that exists nationally is, in my view, a starvation wage. And that is why last week, alongside young people in the fast food industry who are standing up and fighting for dignity, I introduced the legislation that will move us to $15 an hour minimum wage over the next few years. I strongly supported the Affordable Care Act. It has done a lot of good things. But we should understand that the United States today remains the only major country on Earth that does not guarantee health care to all people as a right. And that continue fighting and introduce legislation for a Medicare for all single payer program guaranteeing health care to every man, woman, and child. Now, when we talk about justice, when we talk about the need for all people in America to be treated equally and with dignity, we have got to deal with some hard realities. And those realities include the fact that today, if you can believe it, and I know you can, one in four black males born today can expect to spend time in prison during their lifetime unless we change that dynamics. This is an unspeakable tragedy. 
and this country can no longer ignore that. Blacks are in prison at six times the rate of whites. A report by the Department of Justice found that blacks were three times more likely to be searched during a traffic stop compared to white motorists. African Americans are twice as likely to be arrested and almost four times as likely to experience the use of force during encounters with police. 13%, and this is an extraordinary figure, and I think not an accident, 13% of African American men have lost the right to vote due to felony convictions. Can't vote, can't participate in the democratic political process. Now, in my view, we need some major changes in criminal justice in America. And as President of the United States, I promise you, my Justice Department will be vigorous in fighting all forms of discrimination in every area of our life, not only in police matters, but in housing, in credit, in every area that impacts minority populations. Across our nation, as all of you know, and we see almost every day, too many African Americans and other minorities find themselves subjected to a system that treats citizens who have not committed crimes as if they were criminals. A growing number of communities throughout this country do not trust the police and police have become disconnected from the communities they are sworn to protect. When I was mayor of Burlington, Vermont, the largest city in the state, one of the things that we did, and I believe this very strongly, is we moved toward community policing. Community policing means that police are part of the community, not seen as oppressors in the community, and that is the direction that we have got to move. Sandra Bland, Michael Brown, Rakia Boyd, Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Samuel DeBost. We know their names. Each of them died unarmed at the hands of police officers or in police custody. Let us all be very clear. Violence and brutality of any kind, particularly at the hands of law enforcement sworn to protect and serve their communities, is unacceptable and must not be tolerated. We must reform our criminal justice system. Black lives do matter, and we must value black lives. We must move away from the militarization of police forces. You've all seen on TV this heavy-duty equipment. It looks like they're invading the city. True. You know, it's like they're going to war. And that is not the signal that police departments should be sending around this country. Police should be part of the community, not an oppressor force. We need a Justice Department which takes the lead in working with states and localities to train police officers. Force should be the last resort, not the first resort. For people who have committed crimes that have landed them in jail, there needs to be a path back from prison. The recidivism rate in this country is incredibly high. People go to jail, we send them out of jail, they have no jobs, they have no money, they have and then we are just shocked when they end up in jail. We must end the over-incarceration of non-violent young Americans who do not pose a serious threat to our society. It is an international embarrassment that we have more people in jail than any other country. It is a obscenity that we stigmatize so many young Americans with a criminal record for smoking marijuana, but oddly enough, not one major Wall Street executive has been prosecuted for causing the near collapse of our entire economy. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. We need to end 
prisons for profit. I do not want corporations making money and more money based on how many people we lock up. The measure of serious and effective law enforcement should not be how many people go to jail, but how many people we can keep out of jail. We need to invest in drug courts and medical and mental health interventions. Mental health, what an issue. So many of our people in jail are dealing with mental health issues, and I can tell you as a senator, I get calls, and I think others do as well. Senator, my brother, I am worried what he's going to do to himself, to other people. We've searched desperately for affordable mental health care. We can't find it. That's a story going on all over America. That is a story that has to change. <laughs> Furthermore, we have to take a hard look. And the tragedy last month in South Carolina reminds me of that so strongly. That there are still those who seek to terrorize, and they are terrorists, the African-American community with violence and intimidation. Some of us thought that that had ended 50 years ago, but it hasn't. We need to make sure that federal resources are available to crack down on the illegal activities of hate groups. There are hundreds of groups in this country whose sole reason for existence is hatred of African Americans, hatred of immigrants, hatred of Jews, hatred of Catholics. That has got to end, and the federal government must be active in ending that. So brothers and sisters, thank you very much for allowing me to be with you and to share some ideas. And let me conclude maybe in the tone that I began. And that is that these are very, very difficult days. No question about it. But I believe that if we stand together as a people, if we don't let people divide us by race, by gender, by sexual orientation, by what country we were born in, if we stand together, if, if we have the courage to take on those people today whose greed is destroying America. If we do that, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish, and I am confident that the Urban League will be in the forefront of that struggle. Thank you.